Grace to you, grace to you, grace to you. Uh, tonight we are in a different location. We're in my daughter's, um, my daughter's house in uh, Somerset West near Hermanus, but an hour drive away. And um, because tomorrow I'm busy, I'm busy here, so we're gonna sleep over tonight. So here we are having a little chat uh, about something that I reckon to be rather important. But before we start that, um, the solar eclipse has come and the solar eclipse has gone. And uh, the Antichrist didn't manifest, uh, the rapture didn't happen, Jesus didn't come back and the world didn't end. Uh, <laughs> it's, it, uh, it never fails to surprise me and to shock me in a way how the Christians will pick up anything anything that they can lay their hands on in order to put some kind of fear into the body of Christ. Jesus is coming back. Where, where, are you okay with the Lord? Uh, how's your walk with the Lord? Um, what happens if he, he comes back and he finds you uh, busy watching television or at the movies? Or uh, how are you doing? How's your prayer life? I, uh, there's always that thing that says you're not ready. The solar eclipse is coming and uh, the rapture is coming and uh, everybody you need to get ready because the end of the world is around the corner well it's not because when i'm talking to you it's already tomorrow in in australia so <laughs> so today the world is not ending because in australia is already tomorrow so look i'm not i'm not diminishing or i'm not um, doing anything uh, to the to the whole concept of of, uh, of of the rapture and the return of Christ, that's something that you must decide for yourself. I have decided what I believe about that, uh, but that you must decide what you believe about that. What what I what I get upset with is all those pseudo gurus, religious charlatans that will use any any occasion to sell a book to push a concept to to do to do a video to in the meantime all that happened is that the moon got in front of the sun and because of god's magnificent distancing of our satellite the moon be even though it's, she is 40 times smaller than the earth and it's 40 times more distant to the sun, yet the, the shape of the moon covers the shape of the sun. That is the magnificent, you know, the Bible speaks of signs and wonders in the sky. And, and I believe that the, the constellations and the, and the, and the comets and, the, and, the, and the, um, the meteorite, uh, the showers and the, and the eclipses are signs of God that says, guys, guys, can I catch your attention for once? Look, it cannot happen by itself. There's got to have to be some kind of a designer behind the design. Behind this miracle, there's going to be a miracle maker. So, but what do we do? No, we just look at it and we say, ah, Jesus is coming back. Well, you know, he didn't. So, shall we maybe leave uh, the, the date of his return to him and, uh, and be happy with uh, the day when he decides to come back? And like I said, in whichever way he decides to do it. In the meantime, in the meantime, love your wives, love your children, be a good person, be a, be a, a witnessing Christian, uh, be honest, be happy, be patient, be loving, be generous, uh, uh, and live a life, enjoy your life, enjoy your life. Take a, take a, a, a sigh of relief and uh, enjoy the, the, the beautiful gift that God has given you, because I don't think the world is going to end soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't quote me if the whole thing goes up in flame tomorrow. <laughs> but that's what I believe, okay? You can believe what I want. But tonight, tonight I want to talk to you about what would you do if all you had left on earth was 40 days? 40 days like Jesus, okay? In, uh, Jesus was crucified on Thursday. Uh, he, he died, um, he, well, he died on, uh, on Thursday and uh, 
he um, he stayed on the cross for three days and three nights. On the early Sunday morning, uh, rose from the dead, and um, and from Sunday until the day that he ascended, that he went up to heaven, as it were. Uh, it was forty days. So, how would you? He knew that he had forty days to spend here. Beautiful, the name 40 has got a magnificent biblical connotation, but we, we don't have time for that. But uh, um, do, during those 40 days, what did he do? Let's, I want to propose to you that his priorities were somewhat different than the priorities that you or I would have had if we all, if we, if, we, if all we had was 40 days left to be on this planet. So let's look at Acts, Acts chapter 1. Verses 1 to 4. Acts 1, 1 to 4. And this is uh, Dr. Luke that speaks, and he says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, this, this is just, it's magnificent. The former account is the Gospel of Luke. He's talking to his friend, and this guy's name is, is, is magnificent. It means Theophilo, Theophilus. Theophilo means lover of God. Ah, man. So, Mario Theophilus. Marchio. Uh, the former account of Mario Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. He's talking about, this Dr. Luke talking about his gospel. Until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. Being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So, first of all, first of all, we'll see that the, the things that he spoke of were the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And that, that's natural. He is the king, and so he speaks of the things pertaining to the kingdom. So this was his first priority. But I want to s submit to you four priorities that I see from Scripture that Jesus had during these 40 days. Number one, and so these are priorities that only a God of grace and of love would have because these are priorities that are directed, pointed at others, not in himself. <coughs> Excuse me. Number one, his priority was to restore the sinner. The main character in this story, in this priority is, of course, Peter. And let's read Matthew 26. Matthew 26, 35. Matthew 26, 35, and see, says this. Well, we know, we, um, we know the story. The story is that Jesus uh, had been taken and had been... Um, he was about to be taken. He was about to be crucified. He was about to... And we are, we are here. Um, he's talking to his disciple after the, after the so-called Last Supper. And he says... Uh, uh, as surely I say to you, um, sorry, um, th 33, he says, Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And then 35, he says, Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. So this is what Peter said before the whole ordeal of the, of the passion of Christ. Have you ever made promises that you didn't keep? How did that make you feel? To your wife, to your children, to God. Promises that you didn't keep. I'm sure to make you... It happens to me, it happens with me, it happened in my life, it happens in everybody's life. You say something, you shoot something, and that's very interesting. One thing that's very interesting is that uh, at the cross, in a few hours' time, from, from when Peter speaks these words, at the cross, under Jesus' body, corpse, let's say, is not Peter, but it's John. You remember? Peter, his name... In, in the Hebrew language is the word is the name Kephas and Kephas means speaks of the law the law that was written on a stone okay Kephas stone the law was written on a stone so Peter is a, is a type of the law 
John, on the other hand, his name is Yohanan, and Yohanan means um, the Lord gives grace. So let me tell you something. When you need help, when you're hanging on a cross and you need help, the law is not going to help you. But grace will be there. If you have a problem, don't go to the law because the law will intensify the problem even more. The only one that can help you is, is the grace of God. So, um, he, he makes this empty promise. And, uh, and then you, you remember that he says, Jesus says, Surely I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. How do you, can you imagine every time, because then we know the story. We know that uh, in, in Matthew, um, later on, the, the, uh, Peter denies the Lord blatantly uh, three times. And, um, and the, in fact, uh, the, the, the Greek scripture uses a word that could be a cuss word. The last time when he says, I don't know him. You remember he, he denied him three times. And the last time he uses a cuss word to intensify <laughs> the fact that he, he didn't know him. So he betrayed him. He let him down. He sinned. He, 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 it's a horrible thing. Uh, this is one of the sins that the religionists say, ah, you will go to hell if you, if you deny the Lord. No, you don't. Because the grace of God is bigger than your sin, no matter what your sin is. So um, he says, before the, the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Now, can you imagine every time Peter heard a rooster crow, can you imagine the sense of failure, the sense of condemnation, the, the sense of uh, uh, sadness and, 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 and failure in his, own li- in his own life? But watch what happens, because Jesus, the first priority is to restore the sinner. No matter what you've done, no matter how you feel you have failed the Lord, his priority is to restore you. Now watch what happens. In Mark, in, um, in Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16 and verse, uh, and verse 6. We see the whole story of, um, of the women, uh, Mary Magdalene and Mary and the other women going to the, going to the sepulchre, to the tomb. And finding the, 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 the stone removed, I had the incredible blessing of uh, uh, being in that tomb and seeing the place where I believe, I, I know, I'm so certain, because the, the moment I walked in and I looked at the slab, my, my, whole, my whole heart collapsed and I started weeping like a child. Um, I had the, 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 the incredible honor and privilege to, to see that place, but uh, they go and they don't find the body of Jesus. Now listen to this. Uh, and entering, uh, so they, they saw that the stone had been rolled away and entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting at the right side and they were alarmed. Now here there's a little bit of a discrepancy because Matthew speaks of two sitting on either side, but it doesn't matter because if it was two, it was one. And Mark and Matthew, uh, uh, you know, they both were not, um, they didn't witness the scene. It was only John and Peter. Mark was, uh, Mark was um, Peter's secretary. So he's, he's writing down what Peter has told him that happened. So he says, listen to this. Uh, this young man, this angel, says to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. And then the, the angel speaks the, the, the tablet, the wooden tablet that is today still on the door of the tomb that says, He's not here, He is risen. Because you cannot find Him in any tomb on earth. And so he says, He's not here, He's risen. See the place where they laid him, but go, now listen, go and tell his disciples and Peter. That, that little word and focuses on the traitor, focuses on the sinner, 
focuses on him who let you down, him who disappointed you, him who, 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 who broke his promise, he who betrayed you. And yet, look at the heart of God. Look at the priority of Jesus in those 40 days. He says, tell Peter, please tell the disciples, but also but tell Peter what? That he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. What, what is the message that Jesus is trying to, to tell Peter? Remember, Peter, when I told you that I was going to go to Galilee? Yes, I also, what, did I to, what did I tell you also? I told you that before the, the, uh, the, um, the, the rooster crowed, you would, uh, you would uh, deny me three times. So relax, because I knew of your sin before you committed it. Guys, God doesn't find out about your mistake, about your sin, when you confess it. Or when you commit it. God is not this old man in heaven with a finger up his nostril. Scratching his head and saying, oh, come on Mario, you did it again really. But I can't leave you alone for a moment that you do this and that and the other. No, he's, he took your sin and he nailed it to the cross figuratively, spiritually, before time began, because the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. So every sin, John speaks of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the nature of sin, the existence of sin, landed on, on, on the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world and manifested on the cross 2,000 years ago. But your sin was was put on Jesus before the before. Uh, time began. So God doesn't find out your sin when you, when you confess it or when you, when you commit it. God put your sin on Christ before time began, manifested it on the cross. Every single sin of humanity has been forgiven and carried by the Messiah, by the Lord Jesus Christ. On him, Isaiah said, he carried our diseases and he bore our sicknesses and everything that went with death and the, and the curse and the, and, um, and uh, the curse of the law and death and sickness and disease and sin, everything was put on Jesus and he paid for it once and for all with the, with the shedding of his blood. So relax, relax. You don't have to. So, Mario, what do you say? That we don't have to confess? Man, you, you can confess. Of course you can confess. You can ask God to help you. You should ask God to help you every time you sin. You know, i got this crazy idea. People say, Marquio, but then what must I do when I sin? i got this crazy idea. Why don't you stop? It doesn't require an Einstein to give you the spiritual answer. Why don't you stop sinning? It's hurting you. It already hurt Jesus 2,000 years ago and before time began. But today he's hurting you. He's not hurting him. He paid for it once and for all. Your sin has been forgiven, gone out, pulverized, <coughs> arrow, like, like the scripture says in John 1.19 when it says that the lamb that takes away the sin of the world, arrow, uh, pulverized, <coughs> Not, don't ever say that your sin has been covered by the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus didn't cover your sin. The blood of Jesus destroyed, disintegrated, pulverized your sin once and for all. So the first priority, Jesus tells the angel, please make sure that you tell Peter that what I told him that was going to happen is going to happen. He's not counted out of my promise of my return when, when we'll meet again in Galilee. We'll meet again in Galilee, Peter, you'll be there. Why? Because I'm not going to send, send a, 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 um, a striking lightning from heaven and, 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 and blast you out of existence because you've trade, you betrayed me. No, the priority of Jesus was to restore the sinner. Number two, restore the sinner, number one. Number two, reassure the desperate. Reassure the desperate. The, the main character here is Mary, Mary Magdalene. And um, same question. How do you feel when everything that you've believed in crashes before your, your eyes? Everything you lived for stops. It is so I, I watched once um, a, a movie, a short, and I don't know what it was. Anyway, it was a story of this sect. 
um, this American pastor uh, that believed in, pro of course, prosperity and everything like that. So uh, they, they exist today, so don't worry about it. But everybody was giving him money. He was living uh, the life of a, of a king. And everybody believed that he was this saint, this guru, untouchable, fantastic and everything until the police intervened because he had done something. Uh, I think he had raped a woman. I can't remember what it was. But anyway, the police intervened and they, have, they uncovered this whole shenanigan, this whole charlatan, this whole criminal that was using the church to collect money. And I remember when this, this youngster that that was on drugs and he said to the detective he said this pastor helped me to get off drugs and that's beautiful and that's fantastic but i thought the moment that this guy finds out that this pastor is in fact a crook and he's a bag full of hot air and and, and he's a criminal everything is going to collapse you've had, you've had a You've had a dream, you've had an idol, you've had the, your, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your, your, your friend, your, your uh, business partner, your, somebody that you idolize. That's why, that's why, listen to me, that's why in a very small way, but, but that's why it's so crazy when you watch soccer, the TV, the fans, the cry, and I'm, I want to slap them and say, it's a ball. It's a piece of pig skin filled with air that goes into a net or doesn't go into a net. But you see, you identify so much with the hero of your story that when he fails, you fail. And here we have Mary Magdalene that sees her idol, in, in, in inverted commas, her Lord, the, the one that had pulled her out. Remember the seven demons and everything? She was a prostitute. The one that pulled her out from that terrible life and the one that was invincible, untouchable, all of a sudden is dead. Everything crashes. Everything crashes. John 20. John 20, verse 15 and 16. Listen. It says, she goes, she goes, uh, we've already read the story before in, in Matthew and then in Mark. This is in John. The, 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 the women, the women go to, to the, to the tomb, to the sepulcher. And, um, and now listen. Um, now when she had said this, she turned around and saw the, well, no. Um, and he had, the, she saw two angels, then 13, then they said to a woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she, she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Amazing. You can preach on this for, for a month, but uh, she didn't know it was Jesus, even though it was him, but he didn't look like him. He didn't transmit. He didn't glow in the dark. He, didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't floating in the air. Um, he was a man, a normal man, thinking that, she, that he was a gardener. Uh, Jesus said to a woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Listen to the she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, let, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Listen, listen to the cry of the one that says, even if he's dead, I'll go, I'll go and get his body. I'll go, I'll, I'll build a shrine. I'll, I'll, make a, I'll make something that will rem remind me of him because he is everything I have. My life depends on him. I've got to keep him alive. He's somehow... I got to take him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And then she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which means teacher. Okay, so now, this is a post that um, I published some time ago, and it says this When you don't know where to turn, when the wave of circumstances blocks every way of escape, when the noise of desperation kills every whisper of hope, that's when you need to cup your ear and listen for his voice. Above the noise of the pain, he's calling your name. You see, what Jesus does here 
he says, by calling her by name, he says, Mary, your idol is not dead. I'm around. I'm still around. I know who you are. I know what you're going through. And I'm still around. Listen, right now you might be going through something terrible. Right now you might be going through something dramatic, something traumatic. Let me tell you something. Cup your ear and listen, because above the noise of the pain, above the noise of the circumstances, above the, the howl of the wolves that bark at your door, Jesus is calling your name. He hasn't forgotten you. He will never forget you. He knows where you are. He knows how you are. He knows what you need. And he will never forget you. He's calling you by name right now. So number one, restore the sinner. Number two, reassure the desperate. Number three, reinforce the skeptic. And the character, the main character here is Thomas. We go to John chapter 20 and verses 26 and 27. Thomas, we all know that Thomas is called the doubting Thomas because um, he, uh, uh, Jesus had, had appeared, he wasn't there. So he said, uh, uh, they, they told him Jesus was here and, they, and he said, unless I put my fingers in his wounds and, uh, and my hand in his, uh, in his side, I will not believe. So we have the saying of the doubting Thomas, unless I see, I don't believe. Now watch what happens because Jesus, one of his priorities, is to reinforce the skeptic. John 20, 26 and 27 says this, And after eight days his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was this time was with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Shalom, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here. Reach your finger here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. Did you know that the name Israel means he who contends with God and wins? There's a story in Genesis chapter 32 about Jacob uh, in, a, in a place called Peniel, which means the face of God. Pane, the face, and El, God. Uh, the face of God, because Jacob names it the, the face, the place, the place Peniel, because he's seen the face of God and he survived. Now, th this is what happens. Uh, he, he starts fighting with with an angel that re represents God, and the angel cannot prevail, cannot cannot beat Jacob. How can that happen? How can God? How can man beat God? How can man? Prevail over God. I tell you how you can prevail by not believing Him. Because He will not force you to believe anything. He will fight with you to the end, to the death. He will try to prove His love to you until the end. But if you don't believe, you will contend with God and win. Let me tell you something. Your doubts are not a problem. Your questions are not a problem. Don't be fearful of your doubts and don't be, don't be um, worried about your questions. God, Jesus doesn't have any problem in answering your doubts and any problem in, any problem in answering your questions. If you have all your, all your answers in little boxes, boxes, rightly ordained one next to the other, you're not worshiping God. You're worshiping a version of yourself that you have put in these little boxes because you have all the questions answered. Don't be worried about your doubts. God is not worried about your doubts. Face them. Struggle with God. And He will answer them. And you know, I answered the, the struggle. I, I, in a way, how He forced Jacob to, to stop fighting. He touched his hip. <laughs> And I've always said, don't trust anybody that doesn't limp. Because my friend, if in your life you never had a doubt about God, if in your life you never had a doubt about His sovereignty or His power or, the, or the, His willingness to help you of something, if you never had it, if everything has always gone smooth and you've always been healed and you've always received all the money you wanted and, and your wife has always been the best on earth and your children have always been the best on earth and everything, like I said to you, you're worshipping a version of yourself, not God. Because this world stinks. The earth sucks and it comes at you and it comes at me 
and is violent with sickness and disease, with poverty, with ugliness, with violence, with lies, with, with cheats, with, with all sorts of things. And if everything goes well, my boy, somewhere on the line, there's something not right with you. But if you can manage to fight with God, limp and yet carry on believing and say, I might not understand why these things happen. I might not understand why. Remember when God, when, when, when God kicked Saul off his mule on the way to Damascus? <laughs> Saul didn't want, to, didn't want to listen, remember? And, and, and I don't know, this big angel's way <laughs> and kicked him off the mule. <laughs> and when he woke up, he, he couldn't see. And sometimes, sometimes God needs to touch your hip so that you can limp, so that you can say, you know what? Maybe it didn't quite turn out the way I wanted. Maybe all my prayers are not answered, but you know what? I will stop fighting with God and I will trust him. Anyway. And that is what I'm trying to say to you, that he reinforces, he reinforces the skeptic because he will come and do everything he can to prove to you what he's saying. And let me tell you something. Don't fear your doubt and don't fear your questions. Trust him who knows the future. If all you are, are waiting for is a cushy future, Don't trust in it. The proof of God's love is not the answer to your prayers. The proof of God's love is the cross. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Your prayer will be answered, whether, whether this time, here or later or on the other side or whenever. Uh, Every prayer, every everything that you ask in the name of the Lord will be given you, whether here or there or later or now or what. But trust Him. I beg you, listen to me. Don't. The truth is not scared of confrontation. Doubt. Faith is not the absence of doubt. Faith is the conquering of doubt. Just like courage is not the, the absence of, of, uh, of fear. If you don't have fear, you, you, you're, you're an idiot. Because, you know, if you, if you face a lion and you're not scared, uh, you know, the lion will eat you. <laughs> no fear, but if that lion is threatening your child and you stand between that lion and your child with a knife trying to defend it, no, that's courage. Your, your knees are, are knocking one against the other, but you still, you're facing your, your fear, you're facing your, and that's courage. You're facing your doubt and never mind the doubt. You still say, even if I don't understand everything about God, I still believe that he loves me. Jesus loves me. This I know. All the rest is relatively important. Number four. So number one. Number one, the, the, the priorities of, of Jesus in, during these 40 days, he restores, to restore the sinner. Number two, to reassure the desperate. Number three, to reinforce the skeptic. And number four, to reveal himself to the world. Now, how did that happen? Let's, let's look at a story, a beautiful story in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. We are... Uh, on the way to a mouse, about 10 kilometers from Jerusalem. And um, Jerusalem, in Yerushalayim means the place where it rains peace. And Emmaus uh, means the place of hot springs. So on the one in Jerusalem, it rains peace. On the other one, it boils discomfort. <laughs> So now listen to this because this is important. These two, these two guys, one of them, is, his name was Cleopas. The other one, some believe it was his wife. She could have been. We don't know who she was or he was. But they traveling, they're going from Jerusalem to a mouse. And what had Jesus told his disciples to do? 
wait in Jerusalem, right, for the coming of the Holy Ghost. He said, wait in Jerusalem. So they do the exact opposite of what he told them to do. So the will of God was stay in Jerusalem. They went to a mass. Any other God would have burned them like a crisp on the way they say, I, I told you to wait. <laughs> but not our God, because our God is a God of grace. He's a God of love. And in the midst of your sin, in the midst of your disobedience, in the midst of your mess, when God tells you stay and you go, when God tells you don't and you do, when God says, tells you smile and you cry, whatever, in that midst, Jesus comes alongside you and he reveals himself to you. Now, listen to this. Luke 24, 18. Uh, then the one whose name was Cleopas. Okay, so they're walking and Jesus comes alongside them and starts walking with them. Uh, and so the one named Cleopas talks to him and he says, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened then in these days? <laughs> and Jesus said, no, what things? No, tell me about it. I don't know. About what things? Now listen. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. No, he was not a prophet. He was the Messiah. So what does that mean? It means that you don't believe that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God, that you are not saved, that you are not son because you're saying he was a prophet. It means you're not born again. So in a way, they represent the world, okay? The people that see Jesus, hear Jesus, touch Jesus, they see the mighty deeds of Jesus, but don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So that's what they say. They say, um, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. Now, 30. So he, we know what happens. He, he starts talking to them and he explains himself from the scriptures. He, he, he shows himself from the scriptures uh, and he, he tries to prove to them that he was the Christ prophesied in the scriptures. But still they don't believe. So now they get to a mass and uh, he makes as if he would go on. Because you see, grace offers you, but faith has to take. So Jesus presented himself. How many times there are people who hear the gospel uh, and, and still don't believe? So Jesus presents himself as um, uh, beginning at Moses and all the prayer, he expounded to them in all scriptures the things concerning himself. So he, he tells them from the scriptures the things that concern himself, but they still don't believe because they, you know, otherwise they would have jumped up and down and said, yeah, hallelujah, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. No. So, um, so the, they, they get to Emmaus, they go to their house, and Jesus carries on because, like I said, grace offers, but faith needs to say, okay, wait, I grab you, come back here. So grace offers, but faith has to take. So now listen to this, because they're sitting down, and as custom is, they eat. It's been a long trip, they're sitting down and they eat. And the first thing they do is they go and take a piece of bread. Piece of bread, and he's the guest, so they give it to him. And as it was custom in those days, uh, the guest would take the bread, lift his hands, and break it. Now listen, Jesus was wearing the, the typical robe of a rabbi with long, wide sleeves. So what happens when he picks up the bread to break it? The sleeves drop. And what do they see? They see the mark of the nails in the wrists. And that's why. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, placed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they knew him. And that word there is the word Edo, which means not only I know, but I believe. I know, I understand, I believe. Why? Because they saw he told them, I'm not dead, I'm alive. This is my body broken for you. 
And this is the blood of the new covenant. Guess who I am? And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And what happened? And he vanished from their sight. Why? Because the moment you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, he goes from the outside to the inside. <laughs> and your spirit is recreated. You're born again, never to die again. So, so number one, restores the sinner. Number two, reassures the desperate. Number three, reinforces the skeptic. Number four, reveals himself to the world. Let me tell you something. When, he, when Jesus shows them the, 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 the wounds, uh, basically says, I was dead and I'm alive and I'm the only one who can do that. Let me give you a piece of advice. If somebody prophesies about his death and his resurrection and he comes back after that and shows you that it's him, believe him. <laughs> because he's the only one who did that. And, and, and you know what? If you, that's the only, that's the only difference that you have between Christianity and other, other religion. Our God is alive. Our God is alive. Our God is not dead. Our God is alive. If you look long enough for Muhammad's remains, you will find them. If you search for Buddha's bones, you will find them. You will find Abraham's corpse somewhere. You will find Zoroaster. Confucius, Socrates, Baula, Ron Abbott, Mary Baker Eddy, uh, Joseph Smith Jr., Young Moon, Maharishi Jogi, Anton LaVey, C.T. Russell's the Pope, Michael Jackson, and every Catholic saint that exists, and hundreds of others, you will find their bones, because they're still here. But if you look for Jesus' body, no matter where you find, no matter where you look, no matter how long you look, you will not find it because he is resurrected. He is risen. So my friend, the heart of Jesus manifests in those 40 days, not for himself, but for his friends, his disciples, his brothers, his sisters, his bride, to restore, to reassure, to reinforce, and to reveal himself. May the Lord bless you. I hope that I have been of service to you.